to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Thank you, Scott Fletcher, and welcome to episode 10 of Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And no Robert. (laughs) (laughs) As you can see, though, tonight we have no Robert window. That's right. No Robert. Is that a window with no Robert in it or a window without Robert? Anyway, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, let's go ahead and get the show on the road here. Jesse, what have you been doing this week guitar-wise? So um, because of uh, last week and not really knowing what I should know about BB King, <laughs> guitar player, <laughs> uh, I took it upon myself to uh, learn more about him. So I've been doing um, – actually listening to it quite a bit. Um, I downloaded some uh, stuff. There's a four disc set that's really good, King of the Blues, uh-huh. and uh, it's really well done. And uh, so I've been listening to quite a bit of that stuff. And boy, he was a rocker when he well, not a rocker, but a rock and blues guy when he was younger. Yeah. Um, very different sound than than the post '70s, you know, later stuff. Anyway, so I'll listen to that and um, uh, doing some YouTube watching kind of assessments of his style and some of his songs and stuff. And, uh, so far my favorite song is actually kind of a jazzy one. Uh, there's one called hummingbird. Do you know that song? No, actually I don't. Yeah. It's really good. Other than the seventies, you know, background singers going off at the end. Um, <laughs> it's got a really good, the solos are good. I mean, they're BB King. It's, there's nothing, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not different than what you'd be used to, but the changes are not typical blues stuff. They're much more of a jazzy thing. Uh, anyway, so that's one thing. Um, I'm continuing my, my cage thing, just working on shapes like uh, across the neck mm-hmm. and um, thinking about chords that way. And so that's pretty much my week. How have you been Cool, yeah. I should definitely get back into the cage stuff. I really need to brush up on that. But anyway, um, I got this book um, from my wife that is called the Blues Guitar Bible. And if it's called the Blues Guitar Bible, then, you know, it's got to be pretty comprehensive and it's got to be pretty much everything there is to the blues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started messing around with songs in that book. And one of the ones I pulled out was uh, one of my favorite blues standards is It um, It Hurts Me Too. Mm-hmm. Elmore James tune. And, and of course, tons of people have covered it since then. And it's a slide guitar in um, open D tuning. And so, yeah, my poor guitar strings. I've been tuning down a lot, <laughs> taking these things down to, to an open You need D to just tuning. leave one of those things on your wall. I, no, <laughs> what I need is one of those tronic systems we were talking about oh, yes. uh, off air. I can just you know, push the button, tune down. Yeah. Anyway, so I messed around with that some. I uh, started messing around with Cherry Red Wine. Have you ever heard that one? Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Luther Allison, awesome song. Uh, in fact, I was talking to my instructor tonight about it, and I think we're going to start working on that song together and seeing how far I can get. It's 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 mostly an aspirational song for me um, mm-hmm. because it's a real hard song, but it, it'll be fun to play it until I hit a wall and just see sort of where that wall is and, and learn a lot of really cool like blues licks along the way because right. it's a song with lots of licks in it, lots of fills in yeah. the song. Um and then, you know, I've been just working on eight bar blues patterns and uh, some soloing over 12. And uh, I also got along with that book this week, I got this Ibanez Tube Screamer. Oh, Actually, it's a DTS9 DX. Ooh, sweetness in a green wrapper. Yeah, absolutely. And it's got this mode button, which takes you. They claim it's the original TS9. And then there's a plus mode, a hot mode and a turbo. Mm-hmm. And I know reading from a paper makes for a really bad podcast, but I'll do it anyway because I don't know how to make a good podcast. Um, <laughs> the plus mode um, is a grittier than the original tube screamer. The hot mode is a crunchier tone with boosted mids that will have sounding will have you sounding like you've just plugged into a wall of four by twelves. Ooh. And then there's Turbo, delivers a powerful bottom thick sound popular with today's alternative modern rock guitarists. Turbo. So it's like four pedals in one, the Tube Screamer DS, no, Tube Screamer TS9DX, excuse me. So um, 
Yeah, it's fun. And, you know, it comes with this little sheet of paper I was just reading from. It has uh, four, like, sort of settings to get you started. You know, turn a dial here, you know, there, whatever, to get this book to sound. They're pretty good settings, to be honest with you, Mm -hmm. in the instructions. I mean, you know, your your tone purist will probably say, oh, you got to turn that dial to... 12 15 to get the right you know 3. 0.5 <laughs> the 3.5 pass whatever right but no i mean you know you rough it in you play with that a little bit and it's just a good starting point then you can start you know changing the dials one at a time a little bit of scientific method you know Absolutely. change one variable see how it plays and uh so yeah i've been having a lot of fun with that um playing with this through pretty much all of my guitars and also um but through the um front man that i have the front man 25r amp sounds all right I would love to put this thing in front of a tube amp and see how it sounds. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'd love to do that because I bet it's, it's probably pretty killer. Yep. I mean, a lot of the greats, you know, tube screaming is a classic, you know, yeah. Eric Johnson, Stevie Ray. I mean, a lot of people have used it. Um, and yeah, you know, it's funny because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, at lore sort of built up around the yeah. tube screamers to where, I mean, I remember when they changed from the TS nine to the TS 10, Sort of, it was a cheaper build and everything, and people were like, "Oh, this doesn't sound like the other one." And then it got uh, to people were saying, "Oh, you have to have the original TS eight hundred eight, you know, the old." Oh one. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but of course, like anything, it's kind of like pickups and guitars. I mean, it, when they originally made them, it was like um, the quality control wasn't great, so there were great ones and only good ones. <laughs> right, right, you know? right. And I, to I be honest, I, I've had probably four different. I've never had a TS9. Let me think about that. I've had a 10. I've had a 7, some tone lock version of it. And I uh, can't remember the other one I have. But they all kind of sound the same to me. Or yep. really in the same. I shouldn't say the same, but so close that it's just like, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure like, you know, back when the TS-808 people came out, people were like, oh, but that's not as good as the TS-708 or yeah, <laughs> I mean, whatever it was. was. Right, the nostalgia. If there was anything before, I have no idea. I don't know my pedal history well, very well The original one was actually not an Ibanez. It was a Maxon. And I don't know if Ibanez, if it was a, a split that Ibanez made them or if they bought the company. I'm not sure how that worked. But I'm sure there were arguments about the better ones then too. And like yeah, oh, chips because yeah. they did use different chips even though it was the same exact model. So uh, all that right. stuff. Well, you know, this is my third pedal manufacturer. Um, I've, I have a Boss, um, the Orange Distortion, mm-hmm. right? I have um, a Digitech Screaming Blues or Screaming the Blues or whatever. And now I have this Ibanez uh, 2 Screamer. And, you know, they're all good. Yeah. You know, they, they all do their thing. There's like there's something that they do. And uh, if you like that sound, you're going to like the pedal. Right. And if you don't like the sound, guess what? You're not going to like the pedal. Yep. And they're made well. And, yep. you know. Yeah, they had all three of them, different manufacturers. They're all made well. I feel like, you know, I can stomp on these things when I'm playing and I don't have to worry about them falling apart or mm-hmm. anything like that. So, yeah, um, I'm pretty happy to have it and uh, definitely been having a lot of fun with it this past week. <laughs> That's what it's for. Yeah. yeah. And it's green. <laughs> and it's green. It stands out. Of course, so far I have orange, green, and blue. So it's kind of hard for any of them not to stand out. You know, the, the, the so what, what are you missing for the rainbow? You need a bright yellow. You need an a bright- old DoD Overdrive Plus. Yeah. 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 Classic. I think they're reissuing that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my first fuzz box. Yeah. Yeah. You get to keep an eye out for that one then to complete the rainbow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I can see now. Why? Uh, what? What pedals do you choose for your pedal board? Uh, I'm just more interested in completing the rainbow as opposed Color. to the sound. <laughs> I choose pedals the way girls choose football teams. <laughs> That's right. Oh, dude, they're, they're so, so bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. That's, <laughs> bad. That's, that's bad. That's bad. I'm sorry, actually, women. I'm sorry. In fact, you might actually, wrong. you might actually elicit our first comment because of that. <laughs> Someone might actually comment on our show on, on that. That's terrible. I apologize. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, for those of you that we haven't um, scared away yet or have pissed off, uh, let's go ahead <laughs> to our uh, into our next segment. This guitar, this this Fortnite in guitar history. And uh, Jesse, you found several historic moments um, this time around. So let's go ahead and go through them. What's the first one you want to talk about? Well, the first one I'll talk about, I guess, uh, on the uh, on October first, nineteen sixty five, um, the Beatles released "Yesterday" as a single, and that's important because it's one of the most covered songs like ever. <laughs> I think there's like three thousand versions of it out there. Yeah, um, 
I don't think it, it's the most covered song, but it's definitely up there. And uh, and it's a great song, you know. I, so. I like the Guns N' Roses version. In fact, that was the first version I heard of that song. And I was like, oh, so the Beatles did this. Like, I guess I've never really been a huge Beatles fan. And maybe that's like the next thing said that will uh, upset all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It depends on the age of our, our uh, listening yeah. audience. I grew up with the Beatles. So my dad was a big you know, Beatles fan in, in yeah. all the 50s and 60s. So I respect them. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. It's just that, you know, if I'm going through and I have uh, a couple Beatles albums. But when I'm going through my playlist, you know, listen to something, it's, I, it's not what I tend to pick. It's hard because they're so ubiquitous. I mean, you know, you've heard everything so many times that it's sort of hard to choose them. I think the most important thing about yesterday being released on October 1st, 1965, was that it was released when I turned negative 11. (laughs) (laughs) A date that will live in sort of negative infamy. (laughs) That's right, negative infamy. Okay, Uh, second date, uh, October 3rd. Stevie Ray Vaughan was born, my favorite blues player, so... Oh, uh, absolutely. Have to bring Stevie Ray up. Yep. Would have been 60 last Friday. Yep. I keep looking for like new bits, you know, new concert stuff or whatever, you know, out there when I'm on cruising YouTube. And he's just so, just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have um, a guitar book, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, like greatest hits or whatever. And like, yep, every one of those songs is aspirational at this point. <laughs> There's no oh. way. I- just Dude, amazing. inspirational for me, man. His feel, oh. his technique is just ugh. crazy. Yeah, crazy, crazy not player. Te- not that technique is the pinnacle of playing, you know, in any instrument or any, you know. But right. as far as blues goes, man, his technique was just good. And I think we've talked about this on the show before, but have you ever seen the video where his guitar tech um, swaps out his guitar while he's playing? You know what? I haven't seen it yet. You told yeah. me about it and I forgot to uh, – I didn't that know out. if you'd seen that. Yeah, that's it's just it's just wild. I mean, it's like the seamless. I mean, this is showing not just a high level of ability from Stevie Ray Vaughan, but also from the guitar tech. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, just being able to slide that guitar right in, strap it to Stevie Ray while he doesn't even miss a beat. Just, yeah, yeah. Got to hire the best techs. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. And then what's our third date we have? Well, actually, it's uh, it, this week. <laughs> it's the fifth of this year. Um, so BB King canceled his uh, the rest of his tour, and uh, yeah, health reasons. And I, I forget what the uh, the reasons were. I think he collapsed or something. And uh, so, I'm just wishing BB King well, and hopefully, he can come back and record something. Or, I mean, I know his tours have been shorter, and he's been doing less on the tours, and you know, not doing so well, but. Um, yeah, I want to keep him around for a while. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think what happened to us, uh, he had an issue of exhaustion and dehydration, I think is what the report mm. that I had read. Okay. And uh, from what I saw today on Facebook, um, he is supposed to be doing better. Oh, excellent. So that's great news. And uh, definitely we wish BB King well and a speedy recovery. And because we would definitely want to be able to enjoy many more years of his music um, out there playing. Um, so yes, be well, BB. We love you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's go into our main topic then. Uh, tonight we are talking about recording, not recording podcasts, but recording music. Although <laughs> I guess recording podcasts are, yeah, it's, it's a similar kind of thing, really. Kind of, and we yeah. thought, yeah, we talked about, we thought we talked about hardware versus software platforms, uh, different tracks, um, versus live recording, all these different things, um, about recording. So, uh, I know I like to use GarageBand because, you know, I'm still kind of new to the recording the guitar thing. And I kind of find GarageBand on my Mac is just kind of plug and play, Mm -hmm. you know, and I sort of like that. It doesn't get in my way of, um, trying to, uh, just get to the recording. And typically when I record something, honestly, I want to record a backing track for myself. So I might record myself playing a 12 bar blues and then I can work on soloing over that or I can listen to it and say, all right, what doesn't sound right? OK, clearly I need some help with that chord change or clearly I need to practice this chord because I'm muting the A string or, you know, whatever um, the case might be. So that's been sort of my primary experience with um, recording, although I have tried another one. I have this audio box USB interface by Presonus and there's a Studio One software, I think, is what they make. 
Mm -hmm. And I found that to be fine, too. That was actually the first stuff that I used and uh, didn't know what I was doing, followed the instructions that came with the, the software. And ultimately found the very basics to be straightforward. Now, I have very little or no experience of editing and doing all of that stuff. Um, but as far as plug and play, I've had success with both. Although now, since I've recently sort of moved into the Mac world, GarageBand has been sort of my go-to. Right. And then that makes a lot of sense because as far as a freebie or essentially a freebie, it's pretty fully featured and it gives you a lot to play with. You know, it takes a while to get to where you move beyond that into – well, whatever you'd have to replace it with, you know, for money. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess, what is it, Final Cut Pro? Or no, not Final Cut, uh, Pro Pro Tools. Pro Tools is yeah, the it's big the, popular one, yeah. Yeah. So in PC land, there's, because I don't know anything about Macs, <laughs> but in PC land, there's um, the probably the most popular multi-track uh, uh, software, f- free software is called Audacity, which is pretty cool. Um, it's not the easiest interface. I mean, it's pretty... It, works pretty much like most do. Um, but I have gotten used to other things. So I guess, you know, it's just not intuitive to me. I mean, some, a lot of people use it to great effect. And again, it's free. Um, I don't think it has a lot of like built in MIDI stuff. I mean, it's really an audio kind of tool. Um, there's some other MIDI things. I think crystal is one that kind of combines audio with MIDI. If you're into like MIDI programming as well. Um, for those who don't know, MIDI is like, uh, not recording audio, but recording sort of instructions to play back instruments like, um, you know, you might do with a keyboard um, or drum machine or whatever. Um, so, oh, another one I should mention is called Reaper, which is it's uh, it's not freeware. It's shareware, um, but it has MIDI and it's got a really good audio multi-track, you know, following. I mean, professionals use this thing as well. And for a single user license, um, you can actually use it as long as you want for free, but you should buy it <laughs> if you, yeah. you want to, you know, actually use it. And it's like 60 bucks if you're not, you know, uh, using it for profit. Um, and it's really good. So, um, and, you know, all these things, you can just go and check them out and just see what you what you think of them. Oh, that's nice. The option to basically try it before you buy it. Mm-hmm. is a nice option and quite honestly for good software 60 bucks is not that bad oh no uh, and they you know. they respond really quickly the program is updating it all the time yeah so um yeah it's a really good program now these are all of course multi-track you know record one thing play it back record the next thing record it back um which i think most people get into eventually <laughs> you can't just record stereo you know yourself and play it back but that's pretty limiting. Right, right. No, I think one of the things that I wanted to get into and I just haven't had the time was um, when I was watching you record the um, theme for the show. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you came into my house, you plugged it in the garage band, you started playing. And then I was like, oh, that's interesting. You played this part, right? And I'm like, but there's not a whole lot there. And then you added a new track mm-hmm. and then you played over top of that. I was like, Whoa, I never thought about doing that before. So I'm like, I'm really at the beginner level when it comes to recording. And, you know, this idea of multi track where you lay down a track, lay down another track, lay down a third track on top of that. And you to get this really rich sound that you can't get by yourself, you oh, know, yeah. just playing, you know. And so I've definitely wanted to come back to that and try sort of that a little bit of that on my own, where, you know, I just, um, one of the things that have also, um, sort of I realized while recording is that playing music is hard (laughs) because you know like when I'm writing uh, let's say I'm writing something in word all right so I'm writing a document if I screw up there's a backspace key no problem Mm -hmm. right my skills at editing audio aren't there yet so if I want to record let's say two runs through through a 12 bar progression and I'm sounding great and then bar 23 I screw up well, for me, if I want to keep that recording and use it, that means going all the way back to the beginning <laughs> right. and re-recording and getting it right you know, the first time, um, which is good practice for me. Don't get me wrong. You should be able to do this stuff and do it right the first time. But I found that to be a bit challenging. Uh, I need to learn how to edit. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, editing is one thing where you, let's say you, know, you, do your 20, you make a mistake on the 23rd bar um, 
once you get pretty slick, you go back and you take like bar 11, which would be the same chord, the same, you know, whatever. And then you just copy paste it over top and boom, fixed, you know. Right. And you can massage it in there and do some like, uh, you know, fade it in so that you can't really hear the edit. Um, Of course, later, and this is the way a lot of pop music is made, you know, you just do one set of whatever, 12 bars or whatever it is. And then you copy that and then you paste, 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 paste. And you build the song that way. That's your rhythm track. And, um, you know, there's there are discussions about whether that's a good thing to do or not. Certainly it makes the production very quick right. um, and easier. And for a lot of pop songs where the emphasis isn't on the rhythm track anyway, they listen to the lyrics and, you know, whatever they might be. Um, but it doesn't have a different feel. I mean, kind of the neat thing about the way music breathes is it's a little different every verse. Right. You know? Right. Now, you can do that a lot of different ways. You can stack on another instrument that wasn't there the first time around or, you know, do all kinds of audio tricks. But, you know, just doing it through is one way. And as you said, that that's what we do is we want to do as musicians is be good enough to play all summer. Because right. like, if you go well, play 12 bars at a time, like, how good are you going to be playing out? <laughs> You are and the one thing though, at open mic night, you can really blow through a lot of songs. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's like for five minutes. I played fifty songs because I do twelve bars at a time. <laughs> twelve That's bars a song. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh yeah, so I tried um sort of looping, if you will, you know, playing twelve bars, playing eight bars, whatever, and then copying and pasting it. And I haven't quite got the skill down yet where I don't get that awkward pause Mm -hmm. in between. So, yeah, I have a lot to learn when it comes to recording. And unfortunately, I don't have the time. And so if I have a choice between playing around with recording or practicing, I'm going to default to practicing every single time. Oh, yeah. Uh, But I figure at some point, you know, I'll be good enough at guitar where I could actually spend more time learning recording as well. Yeah. It's the other thing is it's kind of like I don't know like be, becoming good at guitar and then you know when you play out and you, and you the first time you actually play in front of people it's a different thing mm-hmm. you know and the first time the recording light is on it's a different thing I shouldn't even say the first time it's like the first dozens of times you know <laughs> and you, you you have to get used to just that you know feel of okay it's recording one nice thing about the new uh, software and everything is you can just keep it going and knowing that you can edit little things, which actually lets you relax and probably do a better take than if you were freaked about, it has to be perfect. You have to redo the whole thing. Right. Well, you know, and another thing too, that I'm running into, um, and this has nothing to do with playing guitar or, well, it does have something with playing guitar, but it doesn't have to do with, with the guitar or, or, um, the preamp or the software, an appropriate chair. Right. And so because like I have the chair I'm sitting in right now has arms, Mm -hmm. but it's at the right level to work on the computer, to see the screen, to do these things, blah, blah, blah. Right. But it has arms and it's hard to play guitar in a chair that has arms. Right. To do it well. You're all you're sitting on the end of the chair. You're about ready to fall off. Right. The other chair I have in my in my room here is uh, basically a folding chair, which is too low. Yeah. And so I think part of one of the things I have to solve is, you know, getting an appropriate recording space. And and it's not necessarily, you know, talking about soundproofing the walls or, you know, all of that stuff. It's just getting a comfortable place to play and record, which I don't really have right now. I need to find another piece of furniture or whatever the case might be to to sort of solve that problem. But it's it's part of recording, right? I mean, you have to be comfortable while you're recording and maybe i should stand i don't know but um i i'm a sitter when i play (laughs) yeah me too yeah you know i find standing while i play awkward which uh i know i have to get over at some point if i ever want to play in front of people because very few people get away with sitting you know and playing well I'm i'm a sitter when i'm recording or trying to you know work on something like that when i'm just kind of playing you know along with things then i can stand and that's fine yeah. But it's like I can't do that and record or and, and like seriously practice, which is kind of weird, or it's just more difficult. So yeah, yeah, recording it's a it's a thing all, all into its own. Well, what would you recommend uh, people who are like you know, let's say they're they're fairly far along in their guitar uh, ability and are like you know what, I want to get into this recording thing, and not necessarily for commercial sales, but for themselves, right? 
how would you recommend somebody get started? Well, probably the easiest way, so therefore the first way, would be to get some sort of backing track. I mean, there's a ton of these things, you know, on the internet, on, uh, on YouTube even, if you just, you know, backing track, guitar, whatever, and then and download one and um, put it in your um, garage band or whatever software you have. And you should be able to put it in there as uh, a stereo track or, you know, two separate tracks. Left and right will be like tracks one and two. And then as that plays... Go ahead and record the third track, which would be some blues licks or whatever whatever it is you're into, mm-hmm. and um, and see what you you think. And a lot of people actually do that, and they'll play over people's backing tracks and then repost them to YouTube. And of course, feel free to do that if you want to do that. And the backing track person's cool with it. Um, but that's kind of a cool first step because it's all kind of done for you, and you're really just kind of dipping your toe in the water. The next thing then would be to um, thin out the backing track maybe only take a a drum beat maybe um Mm -hmm. which you can also find and then put your own bass line to it put your own rhythm guitar to it put your own lead to it maybe put your own vocal to it you know and certainly if you're down to the point of where you're only starting with a drum beat you could pretty much write a whole new song you know and and right and do that um and then the next step after that is start from scratch get your own beat whether it be a drum uh loop or drum machine or you know a computer drum machine um the thing is every step here along the way requires really digging in and getting into you know i mean you can get really good at recording guitar and then you go to record say vocals and it sounds because the techniques for recording them are totally different i mean obviously i can just record through a modeler and get sort of a good feel for various sounds um but it's hard with a vocal. You have to do it with a microphone. Right. So then you get into choosing microphones, um, a preamp or however you're going to get it into your system. And these are whole new discussions, which we're probably going to have <laughs> in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about vocal recording on a guitar podcast, but I mean, sure. you know, a lot well, of but, you know, some people do vocals when they play guitar. Many people do vocals when they play. And so that's, it's kind of part of it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, w- I know with GarageBand, they actually have different drummers. So you can choose, you know, I want, you know, Joe, the drummer or whatever. And they actually have names and, you know, and they have different styles. And so they have these, you know, these loops that you can you can um, use for your recordings, which is which is really helpful. Um, because if you want a rhythm going, you want a beat going, you know, you have to have either a drum machine or some kind of drum going that you, you know, want to play along with. Unless you're just doing a pure guitar um, instrumental, which you can do, is, you right. know, it's perfectly fine. But I definitely find having that drum track to be helpful. Oh, and yeah. Keeping, and keeping time. I mean, I'm not – I'm definitely not at the level of proficiency where I can um, stray way too far away from that. Mm-hmm. And I've yeah. always found that drums are – to do them well is the hardest thing for me because, mm-hmm. you know, after like listening guitar and, you know, recording and playing and everything, it's like I, I have a pretty good feel for guitar sounds and vocals too and bass and whatever. Um, not so with drums. I mean, I'm really not good. I mean, I like the prepackaged stuff, you know, and there's software out there, you know, um, uh, I think BFD, (laughs) I'm not going to say what that stands for, (laughs) but it's a software that's just, you know, basically virtual drums, um, easy drummer. There's a lot of them, you know, but they're basically drum machines or drum programming, uh, software for computer. And it gives you a really high quality drum sound. And some of them, they really, they let you like put a virtual microphone at various virtual places around virtual drum sets. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so much easier than making up a drum set in your basement. That's for sure. Sure. And learning sure. how to play. So. Much cheaper too because drums are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, if you're going to go that far, you really ought to have a drummer at least program it because they're going to do a good job. Right. Giving you a drum you know, track that's sort of real world. <laughs> right. Right. They know what they're doing. Just like a drummer who would want a guitar part would want to have a guitarist working with them. Right. Right. On, on a recording. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and at that point, when you're starting to think about that, boy, you're getting into being a band. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and all the uh, all the interpersonal stuff that goes with that. Yeah. Yes. Which, again, another show. Absolutely. <laughs> being in a band. Uh, yes. Which I have no experience with, but uh, that's fine. Um, so uh, anything else that you'd like to say about recording? Well, we we talked about software quite a bit, and that is kind of the way to go these days. Computers are so powerful, and, and um, the equipment is so 
you know, there's so much of it out there. Um, you can go with hardware recorders, um, which um, essentially look like little mixers, you know, and you can get little eight track recorder, 16, 24, whatever. And they're only a couple of hundred bucks now. Um, I remember when I started, there was these cassette porter studios. So if anybody remembers what cassettes were, <laughs> these would be four, uh, four track and then later eight track um, recorders. So you could record one track, then play that back, record a second, and you had four tracks. That's it. Now you could get s- s- tricky and bounce three of them down to a fourth track and then free up the first three, but then you couldn't could do any further, you know surgery on those tracks and but people would do that to get up to i guess 10 tracks or so and of course the sound quality went downhill when you did this right but that was the original thing now of course a little thing that'll fit you know in your in your guitar case will have eight tracks to it digital you can take all kinds of different takes and whatever it's not as flexible these these creations um as software but um you can take them anywhere so go Mm -hmm. sit behind you know the shed or something and with batteries you do your recording if you like to record right. in the woods there you go and what's nice about the the newer ones too is um often they'll record onto like smart media or some kind of hardware where you could just pop that out and whatever tracks you recorded now you can mix them down in your computer right or right. add more to them or whatever so the ideas can flow wherever you want and and then you for the big thing you use them in the computer Sure. Well, and even, you know, when you're talking about these little portable devices, um, we were talking the other day about uh, Tascam has the small and, you know, that's not the recording in the sense that we've been talking about, but it kind of is in a way, you know, you could take that with you to a lesson Mm -hmm. or if you are walking in the woods with your guitar and say, oh, I've got this inspiration for a song. You can just whip out that little recorder, play your thing and then, Mm -hmm. you know, have that and you can either incorporate it into something more complicated like GarageBand or, or, um, um, or one other one, or you know, built from there on the recorder. But uh, I've been interested in getting one of those little task cam um, recorders because I think it'd be real handy for lessons, especially. Oh yeah, you yeah. know, I, well, I have one you should borrow. I have a, it's an older Zoom model actually, <clears throat> and I think it's got three tracks in it. Um, okay. But the thing is, the size of um, like a pack of cigarettes. I mean, that's that's something this thing is. And of course, it had all the Zoom sounds of the time, which aren't quite as good as modern, you know, when you buy this year. (laughs) But not bad, passable. And it recorded on um, actually old smart media cards, if you remember them. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, you wouldn't use these for probably a studio recording, more because of the guitar effects and the sounds that you would have to put down than the, um, you know, the electronics. But still. Right. But it's a great uh, sort of notebook. Right. Well, you know, and if anybody from Tascam is listening to the show and would like to send us a review copy. Absolutely. Message, message send, us. Send two. Send two. <laughs> send two. <laughs> Email us. Six strings and things uh, at jestercat.com. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. No, it's SST at jestercat.com. We changed our email and uh, I totally forgot. That's so, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Send us two. Uh, definitely, we will give a good thorough review, a very positive review, even though I've never touched one before. I'm um, sure it'll be very good. <laughs> I'm sure, absolutely. <laughs> yes, because my uh, yeah, I'm easily bought. So, uh, <laughs> 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 all right. So, uh, shall we wrap this up? Absolutely. All right. Well, if you would like to, dear listeners, share with us your ideas on recording, how you like to record, what you like to use to record, please tweet us at SST Show or send us an email, SST at JesterCat.com. You could also message us on uh, YouTube. Just leave a comment on the video. And iTunes, for those of you that are audio listeners, post a comment. Let us know how we're doing. So until next time, boys and girls, just remember, keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at jestercat.com. You can also email the show at sst at jestercat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 